So the first question is, you know, why should you worry about usability? Um, you know, one approach is to think of others. You could be a user yourself. This is from Singapore, actually. It is an offense not to flush the toilet after use, and there's a specified fine. <laughs> we need to get that for the upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, where, do, where do you get good ideas, first of all, for usability? So I think, you know, like I said, you could be a user yourself. You don't want to inflict misery on the rest of the world. Uh, computer programmers have done enough of that over the years. And uh, where do you go to get good ideas? Well, you could say, hey, the web's a new medium. It's hip. It's experimental. Anything goes. Um, I think that would have been a fine thing to say in 1994. But I don't think it's fine anymore. Because, for example, if we want to see what search is like, we can go to the world's most capable information systems company, IBM, and we can try out their search. Looking for John Patrick, this fellow that I happen to know works there. And as we see, we get nothing useful. Or you try the same query over on Google, and uh, the first link offered is, uh, I think, going to be John Patrick's home page. Um, so what does this tell you? It tells you that, well, maybe you can occasionally get interesting ideas from IBM, perhaps from the research department, um, and even perhaps from their home page. However, you're probably going to get your best ideas from organizations like Google that have um, a 100% web mission that have nothing else to do besides a website. I forget why I wanted to lampoon Chrysler.com. I forget what was really bad about them. I think we'll probably find something bad. Um, well, it's straight brochureware, shopping site. There's nothing you can learn here, and there's probably no user experience. So, oh, was there something strange happening here? No, oh, maybe not. Um, versus Amazon, where you can talk to the users, uh, other users, and um, also where the flow is probably more intuitive because they've had to test it very carefully for uh, shopping cart abandonment rates, success rates, and trying to find what you want and checking out and buying it. So anyway, the uh, overall message here is when you're looking at usability, you should look at what Yahoo and Amazon and Google are doing. And you have to assume that whatever they're doing is actually the right thing to do um, in general. Unless you're doing something that's totally different from what they're up to uh, in terms of application. But even then, you probably ought to try to get what lessons you can out of those successful people. And if you're going to depart from the received wisdom of uh, Amazon and Yahoo and Google, you ought to have a good reason for it, not just, well, I think this is better, or I think this looks better. Because they probably tested 15 different ideas and picked the one that worked the best. OK, uh, what about pulling them out of your own head or some other part of your body? Um, do you imagine yourself to have good taste? So you think, hey, I'm a really capable person? Um, or perhaps there's somebody in your organization who's been designated the user experience guru, and that person thinks that you know, he or she is really smart. So let's look at the social psychologists. Um, there's a paper here by some Stanford guys. Again, all everything interesting comes from Stanford. This is Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Whenever am I? Oh, actually, sorry, I'm, it's from Cornell. I was mistaken. <laughs> so I was going to say it's no longer interesting. It's no longer interesting. We had uh, we had a power cut the other day in Tech Square. And I said that um, since we, are off, we oftentimes lose graduate students and faculty in a competitive war with Stanford, that what we should do is um, you know, have weekly power cuts in order to make MIT more like the experience <laughs> of working in California. OK, um, unskilled and unaware, unaware of it, how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessments. So basically, what these guys did 
was they gave people grammar tests, simple grammar tests. People in the 12th percentile, people who are essentially illiterate by our standards probably, um, estimated themselves to be in the 62nd percentile. So your 12th percentile is the lowest 12? Yes, 12th percentile was the lowest. <laughs> they were in the 12th percentile in their grammar ability, and yet they estimated themselves to be above average. Um, so basically, when shown a range of test results by... So you take this person who's illiterate, and you show him all these test results from other people who correctly identified the grammar mistakes. Um, the incompetent people still fail to recalibrate themselves. Um, so let's see. If you were in the bottom, you thought you were in the 66th percentile. Um, you estimated that you were 66th percentile ability. You estimated that you scored better than 60% of the other people. You actually scored better than 12.9% of the people. After you saw uh, other people's results, you estimated your own score as being even higher. Um, and then I guess they were given, maybe they were given the opportunity to correct their scores a little bit or like correct some of their mistakes or something. Um, but they couldn't do it very well. Whereas the top people, they, um, well, maybe that raw test score is something else. No, I guess that's right. Okay, sorry, that's not the 12th percentile. That's the, uh, like a 16.9 on the score. Okay, so the top folks estimated themselves at 69th percentile, but they um, correctly realized after looking at everybody else floundering around that they were actually a lot better than that even and bumped themselves up. So um, the authors conclude that those with limited knowledge in, in the domain suffer a dual burden. Not only do they reach mistaken conclusions and make regrettable errors, but their incompetence robs them of the ability to realize it. Let's go to the GM site. That's always a reliable source of incompetence. So these guys, you know, they see... Yahoo and all these other good sites on the web that are lightweight and have interesting information. Um, they might have seen websites where you can learn something interesting. Um, they might have seen websites without, you know, flashing animated GIFs like Yahoo that are really successful, but they're still unable to realize that, you know, their website isn't working for them, even though. Um, their sales keep going down. So I think that means it's a bad idea to just take ideas from your own head. Because for all you know, you're in the bottom 12th uh, percentile. <laughs> so with the, with the GM side, are there any specific <clears throat> things right there that stand out to you that are? What stands out about the GM site? The fact that there's no reason I would have to go there. That if I wanted to <coughs> learn something about their cars, I'd be better off looking at a brochure and a dealer. That if I wanted to learn something about how cars work or um, you know uh, how to talk to other GM owners, I mean, it, it doesn't do what you think a website ought to do. It doesn't really do anything to build the brand. It gives me generic competitive information compared to Toyota maybe, but... I can get that at cars.yahoo.com more easily. Um, so you mean the content is just not Yeah, for a multi-hundred thousand person organization, if that's the best they can do, you know, that's pretty sad. Um, they're not using the medium in a way. You know, we, we talked about this at the beginning of the semester, right? The, the things that people want are connections to other people, which that site doesn't provide, I don't think. I don't think you can... You know, say, hey, my car is broken. I want you to book me uh, an appointment with the nearest dealer. I don't think it does that. Maybe it can find you the nearest dealer and then you can call them up. But, you know, again, you probably could have done that using the yellow pages. It's not going to actually, at 3 in the morning, let you book a service appointment for 8 a.m. if uh, there's actually a slot free. Um, it's not going to let you look at the service records for your car, I don't think. Um, so it just doesn't just doesn't give you connections to the services that you want, connections to other GM owners to talk about your cars. Um, it doesn't give you uh, an education. It doesn't, they don't use their site to share the knowledge of their company. 
if they have any. And if they don't have any, why are you buying a car from them? Why do you think they don't do that? Because they have other things to do. They can build cars and make them, whereas Yahoo has nothing else to do. I guess so, but if you were a good web person, why would you want to work at GM when you could go work at Yahoo? Where the central like a really good site for cars. Nobody's going to thank you for it. Right? If you work at GM and you do a great job on the website, you'll never be you know, hauled up at the annual meeting and congratulated by the CEO in front of the shareholders because it's irrelevant to their central mission. I mean, if you build a nice factory, um, I'm sure you could get up there. Shai, what are you saying? Uh, uh, Honda Auto has a better site, a much better site. For example. Well, they have better cars also. I mean, they have better people in general. <laughs> but the Honda site still sucks compared to Yahoo. Maybe so, but, but I bet the Honda does value the person that does the website. I, I bet it is an important person. You can go there and fix your own car. You can go there and fix your own car and get a price on it, get connected to a dealer. I mean, it's something somebody would want to do. Okay. You can't do that here. Yeah, it, it, it can be. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't mean to say that every site other than Yahoo and Amazon had bad ideas. I'm just saying that if, in general, if you're going to go surfing around, those are the places to stop first. You can't get like, the owner's manual at the Honda sites or anything like that. You can't? Cannot. Can't get the owner's. Yeah, see, that's like Nikon, okay? I, I was in India, and I wanted the users. I might have, Actually, before I went to India, my friend Rob lent me his $6,000 Nikon D1 and 17-35-millimeter lens. So Nikon's already made you know, $5,000 off of selling this camera. Uh, and yet, you know, they won't go the extra mile of copying the PDF, which they have. They have the manual in PDF form because they distribute it on CD-ROM. It never occurred to them to copy it onto the web where I could have gotten it. Now, fortunately, some user in Europe had done that, so I was able to get it off of some guy's private site. Um, and then when I was in India and the camera broke, I was unable to use the Nikon site to find an authorized service center uh, in India. So it was just a hopeless, you know, experience. And... Uh, it made me write a bad review of the camera saying, you know, why would you want to buy this? So Canon, at least, you can do some of those basic things, although they also don't have the owner's manuals. So, yeah, you think the first thing they would do is put the owner's manual on the site so their existing loyal customers could get what they needed when they needed it, but they don't do it. Um, I'm having a difficult time seeing how we can translate all of the lessons from, or even most of the lessons from something like Amazon, where they have products from a wide variety of vendors to something where, like like Honda or GM, where it's one vendor. Um, because Amazon doesn't care whether you pan one book because someone might just say, okay, I don't want that book. I'll go to another book, and Amazon still gets their cut. Whereas Wait, if a user pans a Honda car... You can't translate everything, but look at... Here we're on a T1, but still look how slow the Honda sites load. Okay. So they could translate from Amazon or from Yahoo, the idea that a website ought to come up, you know, before the user's too old to drive a Honda and needs to get a Buick instead. <laughs> what about, like, the content side, though? I don't know. I haven't looked. I'm not patient okay. enough to really get into these sites, but you can just tell from the homepage that they're going to be awful. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people do. I mean, they give a, you know, the average user session on most sites is only one or two pages. So within one or two pages, they've kind of decided, if you're, if you're, if the site that you build has the look of other sites on the web that suck, then even if underneath it doesn't suck, people are going to turn away and not bother with it. So that's another good reason not to have something that looks too much like, say, GM.com or Honda.com or anywhere else where people haven't gotten what they wanted. Whereas at Yahoo, you know, since people keep piling in there and using it, I think you can assume that people are getting what they want, and therefore if your site looks like Yahoo, um, people will be pretty happy with it. Oracle finally figured this out. I used to hammer on them for... Every time I gave a talk at Oracle, I was able to use their own site as an example of something that really sucked. And they finally said, hey, our site really does suck. Um, it's pretty slow, actually. Um, I think it's a network issue, though. When it comes up, you'll see it's beginning to bear a resemblance to other sites that you might have seen. There was a question somewhere? Oh, do you do usability studies on your site? As far as I know? That's what we're talking about here. We haven't been, huh? That's interesting. <coughs> I hope we didn't come disconnected from the net. All right. Well, we can't show that. Um, so the question is, um, do you need to do a usability study on a site like photo.net? The answer is probably no, because you have 30,000 users every day, and they're sending you email about what they want to be more usable. 
And according to Jacob Nielsen, if you test with uh, you know something like six users, you're going to discover most of the usability problems. Um, now it might be better to do that in a more organized fashion than wait for the email, but it still shows that you don't actually need to do that much. It's not a heroic effort to do a usability study. You can just get four or five friends, sit them down in a room, watch them try to use the thing that you've built, and write down you know what was good and what was bad about it, and you'll get to uh, almost <coughs> all the true usability problems. Um, so the average person found 22% of usability problems in one system. A single expert, somebody who is either an expert on the domain, so in the case of you know Honda, that would be car repair, I guess, um, or an expert on usability, so that would be you know maybe an information architect or something, um, found 41%. And a double expert, somebody who is both an expert in the domain and on uh, information system usability, would pick out 60% of the problems. So I guess the 100% is of the problems that Jacob Nielsen found. <laughs> <laughs> so is he a triple expert? He is a double secret expert. <laughs> how, how usable is his site? His site is actually completely unusable. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I actually sent him an email about this. Let's see if he's fixed it. Useit.com. I do. I give him credit. He did write a book, which is pretty unusable because it's a book. But so here's his here's his articles. Corporate websites get a D in PR, and yet press sections often fail, fail to meet journalists' most basic information needs. Answers. Journalists found answers to only 60% of their questions across a range of corporate sites. Um, reports. Web usability. So let's say you were looking for that thing that biography and photos, public appearances. Um, so I've scrolled down. Tell me where. So you know that that little graph is in there. That's an older um, alert box column. Tell me where it is. What link do I follow on the site? Let's start scrolling back up. Reports, where? Reports. There's Where's report? Okay, there. Maybe. Yeah, it's actually well, the way that I try to do things on photo.net is I usually have new thing, slightly less new thing, a little bit less new thing, a little bit less new thing, and then a link with a bullet, all bulleted, and then a link that says more or older. Uh, and what Nielsen has done is gone boom, 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 and then all alert box columns. So I'm almost never able to find that link. I don't know if it's a deficiency in my brain or if it's a common one. But the fact that it took uh, 35 people or so um, longer than it probably should have. Is alert box a common term? I mean, it's not something that would stand out to me. Well, it's what he calls his thing, yeah. So instead of... I think that's why it, right. for me it didn't show up. Yeah, and who cares? It's like alert box. So you're seeing, you don't, might not even see the headline. Right? You see article, article, title, article, title, article, title. And if it was more, you think, okay, more articles. So you're supposed to pay now. It does have a nice, fast loading page, though. Yeah, I didn't say that it was the worst site on the internet. I just said that it had this one bug that uh, I was almost never able to get past in less than about a minute. Okay. Screen space. Let's talk about screen space. Here's a site called classics.mit.edu. They screwed up their system administration and they were able to recover all their text from Google's database, I think, but they, <laughs> they couldn't get their images back. And they've kept the site design. So this actually gets into the issue of, right, Edward Tufte would tell you that you don't need icons, that you should only use text links because otherwise you'll have to explain what the icons anyway are anyway, as they've done here. And another good reason is if you screw up your system administration and have to recover all of your text content from Google, you won't <laughs> be able to get your icons back anyway. So here's Marcus Aurelius's meditations, commentary, reader recommendations, a text-only version. At the bottom, the title, who wrote it, again, 
when it was written, translated by George Long, but you have to scroll all the way down to get to a page. And then I think that might be the next, no. I thought that might be the next button. Book two, yeah. Same deal. So we clicked on the second chapter of this book and you know I would have expected above the fold, where this is the fold in our virtual newspaper, to have more text up here. And um, maybe this attribution of where it was from, you know, way, way down at the bottom or something. Uh, so they're not using screen space to my mind very effectively. Um, so that's one example. Um, let's do, do look at another MIT site. The Car Research Group at the Media Lab. Huh, this is interesting. Oh, there it comes. So they've taken a leaf from the Honda.com School of Web Design instead of the Yahoo.com School. You don't always have the most reliable internet connection either. So. Really? <laughs> yeah, I guess that Oracle thing is not proof of much. Let's see if we can get Oracle again. Oh, that's pretty good. It looks less. Actually, it was. It's too bad that they've they've not done what I wanted to show you, which is they had directly copied Yahoo, the old style Yahoo. They had two columns. They had these things up here, which they still have. And uh, yeah, they turned it into this direct copy of Yahoo, where this page used to take a whole a long, long time to uh, load. So you would recommend against having those at the top of the these things? Yeah. yeah. Uh, personally, yeah. They I look kind of pretty, but. I, yeah, I, I guess I would take this logo and shove it over to the left, probably, and uh, try to use this for, instead of a search button, the actual search entry form. Okay. Um, I don't know. Some of these things are sort of useful, though. If you want to download the software, it's pretty nice that it's right there. I don't know. I mean, sometimes having the icon points out that it is a, a link rather than just text. Accomplish the same thing with table boxes, though. That's yeah. true. So check this out. Here's the mission of the car research group. Why did That's a media lab. Because so they have a buttload of graphics, and your internet connection, I guess, is a little bit slow. On the other hand, you know, a slightly slow T1 is probably better than uh, a lot of people's modem connections. And I was in India at Satyam Computer. They had 512 kbits shared by 9,000 people. So it would take a minute even to get, you know, an Amazon.com page. So a page that was just text starting at the top that the browser could render incrementally would have been a lot more pleasant. Okay, so what do you guys think about this page on the screen space dimension? Yeah, so if you think about it, um, 20 years ago the average computer had a 19-inch display. And... Um, uh, I don't know, a half a MIT processor or something. So computers are now something like a thousand times faster than they used to be. But the display has, if anything, shrunk in a lot of cases because now people have computers tucked away in corners. So uh, you might have a 17-inch display. You might have uh, a really tiny display on your palm-like <coughs> device. Uh, and yet the screen space, the way that programmers are now using screen space has gotten more and more profligate. In the 19-inch display, in the days of 19-inch displays, you just had text coming up on the top, and the whole screen was filled with text that was presumably of interest to you. Now this screen is almost all given over to white space, and uh, they're wasting your most expensive commodity. So let's look at some Media Lab guys. I pick on the Media Lab because, um, you know, they sort of hold themselves out as experts on how to use these media. Okay, what about this? This is uh, Walter Bender's page. He's some big shot professor. What do you guys think? Content, screen space. Doesn't tell you where you are. Okay, what else? Well, what do you want when you go to a MIT professor's personal homepage? Articles. articles. What bio. contact information? Bio. Bio. So, 
you can find uh, classes that he's teaching. That might get you the homework assignments that some of you guys requested. Here he is skiing with the Pope, as we say. Um, I don't believe he had anything to do with that paper. Ken Haas wrote it. Uh, down at the bottom, there's some contact information. There's a little bit of a bio, but it's way, way down here. So it's a use of screen space that I think most people would say is kind of annoying. Here's my Holly. What do you think of this page? I don't know. Uh, probably they are. Um, I think those might all be graphics. All right, so what's wrong with having all graphics on your homepage? It doesn't get referenced by the search engines. No indexing by the search engines. Probably a little pokey to load if you're on a modem. Give but you one more page to get to what you really want to get to in the first place. So what about the page anyway, in general, though? Compared to the last one. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. Yeah, that this that this guy has blinders on that he can't he can't make the move into the new medium because you know he's like um, if you think about the early days of television where they stuck a TV camera at the back of a live theater and uh, broadcast that and you think of the web as you know taking a, taking a TV camera and sticking it pointing it at a brochure which is what Honda and GM have done and so here's a guy who said oh my personal homepage I'll take a TV camera. And stick it over my business card. I, I, I think that's a really good idea because it really, if, he's, if it's people who he has given his card to before, it reinforces the online and offline thing. I don't think it's necessarily good to put it like that, but sticking it somewhere on the front page of the homepage, I think it's a really good idea. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say it was a bad idea. I mean, I, personally, I would say this is. I think this is a better site than the last one. Um, it would be nice to have a little bit more information about what he does. Well, he doesn't. He may not do anything. It's a media web, after all. <laughs> I don't know. He works on things that think. This links to some of his projects, I guess. Maybe. I mean, you get the idea. If you want real information, they're, they're going down here. It's not clear those are links. Oh, actually, it's not clear those are links. That's an interesting comment, right? Because he set custom link colors up the wazoo uh, and designed a custom user interface. You guys didn't even realize that these things were links. It's true, and you might have a fairly fast connection, whereas GM wants to sell a car to everybody, regardless of speed of connection. And the Media Lab probably doesn't want to deal with you know, people on 28.8 modems because they probably don't have enough money to make a donation. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsor research. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into the link colors in a minute. All right, here's Neil Gershenfeld. Biography, you said you wanted that. Uh, books. Oh, God, where are the links? How do you know any of this link? Yeah. Yeah, now I've turned off underlining. Oh, right. But I don't think that there's any guarantee that everybody will have yeah. underlining <laughs> on. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, so those are some examples of use of screen space. What about time? So basically, um, when you're building your site, you have to think about the put yourself in the user's point of view. Um, you know, when you're building a site, you're not really subjecting yourself to competition because um, you're only working on one site at a time, and you don't say, "Well, if I get sick of this, I'm going to go work on someone else's site." But the user really does think about it that way. So let's say that Joe User's friends calls him up to say, "Hey, Titanic's going to be on TV tonight." Um, or maybe tomorrow night. So the question is, how fast is it for Joe to surf tvguide.com? 
Um, and we want to make it fast. Why do we want to make it fast? Let's see if that's on the next slide. No. Uh, we want to make it fast because if it takes too long for him to figure this out at tvguide.com, he may end up going to an alternative site, a local newspaper site, um, the tv.yahoo.com site. So basically, what are the elements of this? Let's pull up tvguide.com. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Uh, all graphics, so it's going to be slower. Um, TV listings. We're here in 02139. Oops, sorry. We're updating the cable operator database. Interesting. Maybe it didn't help. Cable. That's interesting. So it wasn't smart enough to recognize that wasn't a valid zip code. OK, so that was pretty painful. Uh, what about searching for that Titanic? I don't know. I mean, you, you have to configure where you are. What would you have them do differently in those three boxes? Well, it could have been one. Yeah, uh, the could have a zip code box. Oh, okay. and yeah. Go to yeah, now this should be text, unfortunately, but it isn't. So let's, here, here's scorecard as I built it, as Jin and I built it. As I built it, then Jin ruined it by the EDF's <laughs> instructions. OK, so here's scorecard.org. This is the home page. It will load much faster than that TV Guide home page because it doesn't have any graphics on it. Uh, yet it still has a little bit of a brand identity with colors and so forth. Uh, and if we type in 02139, boom. Well, unfortunately, it spans two counties, but otherwise we'd be one quick way to go to the community page. But, so, but you haven't had to define as many options as TV Guide does. But they didn't ask me for my... TV listings is the number one. You don't go here for news and gossip. You don't go here for Ask the Experts. You go to TV Guide to find out what's on TV. And if they need your zip code, let's see how Yahoo does it. Um, this is also a little pokey. It's loading faster, though. Notice how much faster the page design is loading than TV guides. Um, anyway, the point is... And they're wasting space along the sides of TV guides. So users do have a choice. Users do have a choice, and that's what you have to keep in mind. You have to consider how much end-to-end -end bandwidth do you have between the user and your, your server. So you may not have too much choice. Uh, about what the user has for bandwidth. Um, what's your server engineering situation like? Are you using CGI, in which case it's going to be slow no matter what? Um, or uh, are you using uh, some kind of server infrastructure where the scripts uh, are running inside the web server and the database connections are pooled? Um, and of course, you have to have an adequately sized server for peak loads, because no matter how good your engineering work is, you know one processor isn't going to serve 100 million people at the same time. Um, does the user have a large enough display to view the requested information plus the thrills, frills, or is he or she using a mobile phone where the frills will force the de desired info off the tiny screen into uh, scroll through the WAP deck land? Um, so that lets you talk about how fast can you make it. There's also an issue of how fast should you make it. So what about human beings? You have to ask yourself, how long can people remember stuff? Um, so how long is uh, short-term memory? Because if it's taking you know, more than, say, x minutes between page loads, as it was in India uh, for complicated sites for me, you might ask yourself, you know, can people remember things uh, for more than uh, uh, a few minutes? How long are people willing to wait for a computer? Um, and there's another issue of variability. If your site is slower than normal, 
people will assume the computer that the, 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 the that your computer is broken or that something's wrong with your service, and they'll switch to another service. So basically, if people have an expectation, let's say they've been coming to your site um, over uh, a one-year period every few days, and it's always taken, say, 10 seconds, um, you have to ask yourself, how much variability can you allot before uh, the user will say, oh, well, it's taking it's taken 20 seconds or so so far, so I assume that the thing must be broken. Um, and you're at more and more risk of that if your site is graphics heavy, because uh, with a lot of graphics, you're subjecting yourself more to, say, their ISPs being sluggish. Question? Um, you can manage a lot of light. If you're in India on this really slow connection, it's likely that you might have a, a generation three browser or something like that, which leaves you open the possibility of agents branching from the server side, so that if from their perspective they can offer a richer experience to people with better connections and a text only. You, well, you haven't been to India. I mean, if you go to India, they have the same computers we have here. If you're a kid in the ghetto and you go to a kiosk and you want to do surfing, you have a brand new Windows 98 machine with you know, MSIE 5.5. So I can assure you that computer technology disperses fast enough that you can't say, oh, they're coming in with you know, IE 3.0, so they're probably you know, some benighted third world dweller. Um, and, uh, so you don't think there's any way to they're more likely to be I think, this, I think the people on the oldest browsers are probably working at universities on T3 lines. You know, they're just lazy academics who have been using the web for six years, and you know, they thought Mosaic was good in 1994, so they haven't changed. Or they thought Netscape, you know, 3.0 was good enough, and they're not going to hassle their Unix as admin to upgrade. Uh, okay, so what if you want Joe to work for you? Um, suppose that TV Guide site were actually an online community and people could talk about the shows instead of just look at the listings. Um, and that might involve people guiding each other and co-moderating. So at this point, you've got a vested interest in Joe's productivity. You want him to be as productive as possible on your site to get more volunteer work done for you or maybe if you're paying him uh, just to get more work done for you, period. So the is the site too slow question now doesn't really become, you know, is it too slow because we're going to lose the user and um, he's going to go over to Yahoo. The slow question really gets down to how can we get a lot of work out of this guy? So what's the relationship between computer responsiveness and worker productivity, worker satisfaction, and worker error rate? You have to consider those issues. So there are experimental psychology results that can help you answer some of the questions on the preceding slides. So actually it's seven plus or minus two. Sorry about that, I guess I forgot. Um, the classic paper on short-term memory says that people can only remember about seven things plus or minus two. Um, they don't address time though. So they don't really talk about how long you can remember those things, but there's other papers in experimental psychology it shows that people can only really remember stuff for about 20 seconds. So if a page can take more than 20 seconds to load under any circumstances, it means that people will become completely befuddled and they'll forget what it is that they were trying to do and what they needed to do. Uh, IBM has done research that's more directly related to computers than just memory. They found that if you get one-tenth of a second response time from a computer, you can feel that you're directly manipulating some object within the computer. So that's a good example for, say, working with a 3D model or something spinning it around using the mouse. Uh, if you have a web-like system, now they did this research in 1970 when the systems were all mainframes, but they did have very similar systems where you would click or enter, type something, and then you would get another screen from the mainframe, and then you would type some more, and then you would get another screen from the mainframe. And what they found is that you got maximum productivity when there was no more than one second in between the screens that you know, buying a main mainframe that was 10 times as large in order to get the uh, response time down below a second wasn't really cost effective because it wasn't making people a whole lot more productive, but that getting people down to the point where the screens were coming back within one second was cost effective use of uh, system resources. At 10 seconds, if it takes 10 seconds in between screens, 
users will attempt to do something else in addition to using the computer application. So they will try to watch TV and use the computer. They'll try to read a magazine and use the computer. So now they're really defocused because they're distracted by this other application. So it's interesting that, um, it's really interesting that people seem to ignore this. Like the Honda and the GM sites and so forth are basically just tossing all these results out the window. They're saying, a designer somewhere said, well, I like this, it's got a lot of graphics, it's cool. And everybody said, okay, it's cool. There was no engineer there who said, well, um, from an engineering point of view, here's why what you've done is flawed. Consider, a, you know, here I've done some measurements for the user on a 56K modem, which constitutes, you know, X percentage of the users on the internet. And, uh, you know, here's how you're violating all these principles that were established by IBM. And if you're not uh, up on this kind of research, then it gets down to a matter of opinion. So you say, in my opinion, this is a bad site because it's so slow to load. But you don't really have a good technical argument for how that's going to cut into the bottom line of the person operating the service. So I think it's worth becoming familiar enough with that literature and with experimental results from places like creativegood.com, um, which is a uh, usability um, testing firm, basically, that comes up with statistics and ideas for making web experiences better so that you can have a reasoned engineering argument for why something sucks uh, to supplement your sort of gut feeling that Honda.com sucks or GM.com sucks. And Yahoo is good. I mean, there are real experimental psychological reasons for those. Okay, as a programmer, there's two kinds of words you can be put on the site. You'll be putting on sites. Instructions and error messages. So this also has been researched. For the instructions, you can choose active or passive voice and first, second, or third person. For the error messages, your system can be terse or verbose. So people um, I can also, for error message, you have a choice of just saying syntax error or trying to figure out what's likely to be wrong and offering the user some helpful stuff. <clears throat> um, so people have researched various approaches to this. Um, anthropomorphism is very bad. The users don't like it when the computer says, I can't understand your input. Or I don't like it when, you know, you put naughty words into the web forms. Um, the instructions to the user ought to be second person imperative. So, um, and with no pronouns. So you don't want to keep saying you, 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 like enter your departure date. It's better to say enter departure date colon at the user than anything else. Um, the attempt, attempts to develop very sophisticated error handling pages pay off big time. The users really like it when uh, you can autocorrect some errors and then offer a confirmation page. Uh, it makes them feel that computers are really stupid if they can't figure out you know, what this common error is. So at least run some regex against the user's offending input and see if its defects fall into a common pattern that can be explained on an error page. That's at the very least. The real user interface gurus, though, would say that the best interfaces are ones where you can't possibly make an error. So let me give you an example. Um, over on this side, you could say, type in a date, please. And that lets people do things like type in uh, April 31st, 2001. Um, so, th and, th and that yields an error page, of course, saying, you know, well, there is no April 31st. I hope not, there isn't anyway. There is no April 31st, 2001. Um, on this side, you can have uh, some widgets and forms where you pick a month from a list of 12 authorized months. Once you've done that, maybe there's some JavaScript that adjusts the uh, date range to something that's uh, legal. And then uh, you pick your year from a list of authorized years. And at that point, um, you might enter the wrong date uh, or something other than what you meant, but at least you can never enter an invalid date. So the UI people would generally say, I kind of like these texts, and I think it's faster to type, you know, ANSI, an ANSI formatted date. I'd rather type, you know, 2001, uh, 04, 07, because that's faster than going through a bunch of menus. But the UI people would say that's bad, because if you type in one extra character, you're going to get an error page, 
and that error page you wouldn't even need if you just had the form. Um, color. Let's look at color. So it's always interesting to see a site that has a skip intro. Uh, I guess so. It's IE, so it'll install by itself, I think. <laughs> so here's Brittany. I guess we could skip the intro. I oh, know it's going in. All right, so here's these colors <laughs> that she's using. Um, tour info. So this is in pink. Pink, pink, pink. If there are hyperlinks here, they're not in blue. Yeah, so those hyperlinks are all the same color and they're all pink. What is that? Those are from six months ago. Those dates down. Oh, yeah, that's a slight maintenance problem. Yeah. Okay, so here's. Um, <laughs> so I would say the colors here aren't very, aren't very consistent. Uh, let's look at the .org site. Pink is a big theme with Brittany. <laughs> this is, I think, more consistent at least, in some sense, discography. <laughs> you tell me you're in love with me, like you can't take your pretty eyes away from me. It's not that I don't want to stay, but every time you come close, I move away. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. What amazing song. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't come up with that herself. That's true. So we've seen a lot of different colors on these different sites. <laughs> Pink again. Pink. Um, blue. <laughs> pictures. So the UI burden of using these things is getting pretty, it's pretty hard to separate some of the stuff. Pick any door, quit your day job. Well, that's a banner ad. So it's even hard to tell that this is a banner ad because the color schemes and the UI have been so confusing on all these <laughs> different sites. Whoa. Um, there's a good interview here on geometry. Well, actually, that brings up an interesting question. Since all of those Britney Spears uh, sites Use were pink. based on pink, <laughs> maybe the people who are into Britney Spears are kind of familiar with that color scheme. And so, though it seems off the wall to us, maybe for <laughs> that subset, it's not so wrong. Well, even pink color schemes are something differentiated, like lighter pink or purple. That's true. Um, um, <laughs> I think it's, this is an Australian. Uh, there's a, there's one on geometry, I swear, in here. Ah, do you have a favorite subject? I like English because it's a subject you're going to use in life. <laughs> Stuff. <laughs> Stuff like geometry I'm terrible at. I used to sit there and ask, when am I going to use this in my life? Never. That's when. I thought you guys would appreciate that. Okay, she just wrote a book. That she's using English. Okay, so this is, um, I don't know if you guys have seen this. This is the, I'll back up one. This is the, um, this is the Britney Spears Guide to semi Semiconductor Physics. <laughs> okay, so. And the background is. Oops. The background is a little bit um, distracting. I generally don't like 
you know, a GIF background, but uh, it's not too bad. Notice, though, that the text <laughs> is all basically black and white, and the color <laughs> is used only for information. Let's go up, back up to this. Yeah, so here's the color being used in the uh, uh, to show atoms sharing electrons. And here's colors also used to show um, differential doping in the uh, semiconductors. Um, so basically what this shows is if you keep the site plain text that you can use the colors to convey other kinds of information. But if you um, go wild with the colors to begin with, then it's very hard. You don't have anything left. You don't have uh, that channel left anymore. So basically, the Mac hu human interface guidelines say, it say to never use color as part of your interface. So notice that on the Mac, you know, things like these menus were never in color. Uh, I guess the bar, like Microsoft, I think uses the, uh, the bar up here in color, but then Apple didn't. So basically, the Macintosh has always looked, I think, a bit more tasteful than Windows because of this guideline where they say, we're not going to use color as part of the interface. We're going to save um, you know, red for really dire situations. Um, I personally think that on the web, at least, the blue links are OK, because that's been a part of the web interface forever and ever. Um, if you look at MIT, I think there's some kind of background. Uh, if you look at administration, you see that they've got the links in one color. And what did I want to show you? Uh, actually, I, from med yeah, if you go down here to medical, they've got a totally different color scheme. So I think that, you know, as a school, we kind of screwed up that it would have been better to at least agree on a common color scheme for all MIT web services. But we haven't been able to do that, so every part of the school has a different color scheme. Sure. Wow. Links are blue, and almost everything's a link. The interface seems to be black and white other than that, except for these little icons, which I'm not sure where the Mac finally came down on the little icons. I think I have a feeling that little, the little icons for, say, Photoshop and stuff are, in fact, in color. I haven't kept up with Mac OS, I'm sorry to say. Any computer that crashes while trying to browse a web page is not my uh, kind of uh, computer. It's actually Netscape that made the Mac unusable for me, because I used to have X windows on various Unix boxes up and running, and then I'd be running Netscape, and it would crash the entire machine. So I would lose you know, all my hours of state that built up in the Emacs session. So I finally checked it and replaced it with uh, Windows. And then I replaced my Windows machine with Linux. I now think that Linux is sponsored by Microsoft, that all the Linux hype is generated by Microsoft. They're trying to get everybody to try Linux out and then have it crash on them or have the Windows system crash on them um, so that they'll get fed up and then say, OK, I'm going back to Windows now, like we did the other day in lecture. That was fun. Um, all right, so this is what Yahoo does with color. The answer is not bloody much. They have a band up there. I guess they distinguish off some of their sponsored uh, advertising type links. There you have it. OK, um, what else have we got? Navigation. I talked about this in my one-day course. So Jacob Nielsen, uh, Mr. Useit.com, and author of uh, a uh, Ars Digita Systems Journal article precursor, which is what can we learn from Jacob Nielsen, uh, which I wrote summarizing his 400-page book, so you don't have to buy it, read it, and lug it home. The home page should offer three or four pages, according to Nielsen. A navigation directory to the rest of the site, news, search, if applicable, a quick form that targets the most popular dynamic service available on the site. So Nielsen would have immediately looked at that tbguide.com site and said, this doesn't have element four. I want a quick form that lets me type in my zip code and get TV listings, for, and whether I have cable or not. Right? He would have said I should be able to type in my zip code and whether or not I have cable or satellite. 
um, and done uh, one more click and gotten to a second page that had exactly what I wanted. Uh, logo or site name in the upper left-hand corner of each interior page. So that tells you um, where you are if you're on an interior page. Um, the interior navigation should answer the questions, where have I been, where can I go, uh, and where am I? So let's look at uh, photo.net, learn, say. So this page with this logo up here answers the question, where am I? You're on photo.net. Is that animated? Uh, I don't know. It might have been. Uh, I'm not running this anymore. Um, there's a Yahoo-style nav bar here, which answers the question, where have I been? Except in this case, it's not quite true. But this says, OK, you were on the uh, home page, and now you've clicked down to learn. So this is an idea copied from Yahoo. I'm not sure that we quite, yeah, we don't quite carry it through. But basically, that nav bar should get longer with each uh, each time you go down. So you click here on community, and then down. Hey, I could have sworn that I redid this. Maybe not. Um, click on discussion forums. So now you're you know you've gone from web from the home page to community to forums. You go down to unified forum view. And that snap bar keeps getting, it keeps growing. Well, I guess it didn't do such a good job, but yeah, now it's animated, that GIF. Delightful. Um, where you've been. So Nielsen says you ought to have either a little map of the site and highlight where you are. Uh, you know, it's not very practical on a big site like Yahoo or uh, photo.net. So I think that the best that you can usually do is this Yahoo style nav bar that grows. Uh, one in length as you follow each link down. Uh, where can you go from here? Well, these links are all in blue. They're standard link colors, so it's pretty obvious where you can go from here. And actually, because we didn't change the visited link color, the browser shows us, shows us where we've already been. Nielsen's a big advocate of not changing the link colors. Nielsen's last point is one made earlier in Edward Tufte's classic visual explanations. So basically, um, he uh, says that uh, you want to have all the choices available at once. So a page like this with a lot of links on it is better than a page that sequences you through. Click on ar the architectural section, then click on the garden area or the exterior architecture or the interiors. The fewer pages, the better. Um, In general, would that argue in favor of sublinks as well within those? Categories like if there are five subpages within architecture to actually have them available, like in a list form. There. Yeah, underneath exactly. Now, of course, we just put them up and down, gardens and interiors, because. Um, oh. But yeah, he would say to do that. So by not and he would say that this is very bad. Nielsen really does not like anything that where you where you have to roll over to see what your options are. Um, Anything that's hidden until you roll your mouse over it, he doesn't like this. Same thing with select boxes where you have to like pull down a list and see what's going on. I think it's acceptable in the case of photo.net because you do have other ways to navigate to these things always. These are just shortcuts for kind of experienced users who don't want to figure out how to navigate back out like, okay, now I want to get look at equipment reviews for large format cameras, boom. Someday. By not changing standard colors, you mean stick to the web standards, not? <coughs> it's not, there's no web standard. The question is stick to the standard colors. There is no web standard uh, for link colors, but there are browser standards. So Microsoft has elected um, to uh, make a unvisited link a certain shade of blue and a visited link a certain shade of a purple. Um, fortunately, they copied what Netscape had chosen for that, and I think Netscape copied what Mosaic had done, more or less. So it has been consistent, but I don't believe that there's a web consortium standard for colors. I could be wrong. The, uh, for link colors. Those, those are done with JavaScript, yeah. 
Um, I don't know. We go back and forth. It, it slows down the navigation on MSIE. It actually crashes the Netscape browser, so we had to take it off. Um, it's been a mixed blessing. I thought it was cool. <laughs> Ari developed it. Developed by a Caltech PhD. All right. Think multidimensionally. Let's see where we are. Uh, yeah, we're almost done here. Think multidimensionally. Um, so properly construed web development is always a multidimensional programming problem. Now, in general, most people get worn out just trying to get one working um, user experience implemented, so they never even get to these issues. But if you really had the time and inclination, you would always think of putting your users somewhere on dimensions, like uh, prefers large or small images, prefers a lot or a little bit of detail, um, prefers uh, one language over another, um, wants to see everything or only content that's been um, popular with other people or approved by a moderator, um, authoritative content only or uh, all content. So basically, each of these things can be put on a dimension, and then you can locate a user at a given point in time somewhere in that multidimensional space and then serve the appropriate page to that person. So you know, in this case, we have five dimensions. And the question is, uh, how should you write code for this? Well, basically, you ought to try to have the best content for that particular user. There's different ways of doing this from a programming point of view. One way is just to have um, a tr big tree of if statements. So you have, you know, if he prefers French, branch over here, and then you have all kinds of duplicated code. There's also, um, there's even people who've been coming up with new programming styles. I've talked to people in computer science departments who say, oh, well, we need a whole new programming language to deal with issues like this. And uh, so to avoid this combinatorial explosion of if statements, um, we will come up with this new programming language. So I don't know that there's necessarily um, a need for new programming systems. There's ways of getting around um, the duplication of content and so forth. But I think if you want to, 10 years from now, if you want people to say, wow, that was a fabulous web service that you know, was uh, better than I expected, that you'll probably have to confront this problem of uh, dealing with the user multidimensionally. And notice that this doesn't even treat the sort of trivial problem of users coming off from different devices. People are often, you know, these days they're, they're all happy when they can repurpose their XML page. They render it with an XSL style sheet onto a WAP browser, onto a web browser, onto a voice browser maybe. That's really easy because when the user makes a request, you sort of know where he's coming in from. You see headers saying, okay, I'm on a WAP browser. You see headers saying, okay, I'm requesting a voice XML page from the tellme.com server. Uh, but there's a deeper problem of figuring out a lot of these things you can only solicit from the user, so it's much, much harder than multi-purpose content. Um, so the bottom line is that Creative Good claims that you can increase conversion factors, conversion rates by factors of 1.4 to 2.5. So in terms of um, when the Creative Good consultants, this is a company started by uh, one of Jin, Jin Choi's actually old fraternity brothers uh, from MIT. So basically they have a team of people, they go into a site, I think they went to gateway.com and they were able to uh, something like double the number of people that started off at gateway.com who actually bought PCs from Gateway. Uh, so they're able to get huge improvements in conversion rates going into e-commerce sites and looking at the user experience. Um, I think the same guys concluded that, I forget what it was, something like 50% of people are unable to check out of websites. So they build up a shopping cart on some e-commerce site and then they can't figure out how to check out. So they're losing uh, a tremendous number of sales and a tremendous number of customers. Now, of course, that's not the average across the web because you know, Amazon's got a pretty clean checkout process. So, but what it does mean is that you know, half of the sites are essentially uh, or, or on, on, on if you consider individual sites that uh, users are unable to check out about half the time. Again, Amazon's probably up at 90-some percent because they keep refining their uh, experience. Um, 
the I think there's also a corporate inquiry test that the creative good guys have done where they you know sent people to sites like sun.com and asked them to figure out you know what's the latest version of Solaris or um, you know what's uh, you know what's uh, the maximum amount of memory you can put on a mid-range server or something uh, so basically these sort of product information queries and again they found that only about half of the people tested were able to uh, complete to get their question answered even though the question was answered on the site only about half the people were able to uh, find it and this is on huge corporate sites with unlimited budgets with usability experts with professional designers you know it's not they're not surfing around on geocities um, businesses care only about usability when they're paying the workers I think so basically um, you know the IRS probably has really great computer systems behind the scenes for figuring out whether to audit you or not because they're paying their own workers to uh, you know audit you as fast and efficiently as possible on the other hand um, they don't make that much of an effort to make the front end usable. Like they don't really try to make all the rules simple and easy to understand. They don't necessarily work that hard to make uh, you know their various hundreds of forms easy to understand. Because hey, if you can't figure it out, it doesn't cost them money. You have to go pay an accountant to do it for you. And if that costs you a thousand dollars, well, it's not their thousand dollars. So I think that um, as an engineer you might want to try to get the people you're working with out of that psychology that the bad usability is cost free to them but it's only a cost they're imposing on the user because as the creative good folks show and in a competitive marketplace there are costs to having a site that's pretty unusable all right so i hope that gives you some things to think about screen space time words and color as you're working on piece set one and then your online communities. So questions? We've got a few minutes. What will people use like a frame at the top for navigation and leave it there and then just scroll the other one? Uh, that's a good question. Why not use frames? Anybody else have a theory? Rob? Uh, frames make it really hard for users to bookmark on your site. They bookmark they're bookmarking the frame and for the page drop down. Yeah, so if somebody's reading um, say, the garden photography article on photo.net, and they uh, pull down, uh, send this to their friend, send page by email, and say, hey, this is a great article. You know, it's exactly relevant to what you're talking about. Their friend actually is going to receive the photo.net homepage. And they'll say, God, this looks like a really sucky site. This is nothing like what I want. This is some crummy classified ad and discussion forum site. You know, I'm a garden photographer. Uh, so you have that usability problem search engines just pick up the client page in effect so you just get the yeah that's a good point so Google uh, is going to index the interior page and then deliver somebody directly to that although you could uh, if you had enough uh, web scripting you could notice that somebody was requesting that directly um, and the referrer header wasn't the top level frame so you could say okay they're requesting this interior page their referrer header isn't the top level frame um, so I'm going to redirect them. Of course, you'd get into an infinite loop with anybody who'd set their browser not to broadcast referrer headers, so that would be kind of um, unpleasant for the, a very small minority of users. Uh, debugging becomes very hard. So like users would say, if I had that on photo.net, which has plenty of bugs, um, or has had, has, has had plenty of bugs over the years, I would get um, email from people all the time saying, I got an error on the page http colon slash slash www.photo.net because that's what they'd be seeing in their browser uh, address field while they also got a nasty error message down below. And then I would uh, say, well, I'm not sure which of the 2,000 scripts on this site they're actually complaining about. Any other reasons why frames suck? Uh, let's get one out can't render them. Uh, web TV, I think uh, there's more Web TVs than Netscape. I think Web TV, at least for a long time, was ignoring frames. Maybe they still do. So that's another issue. Pull out the phone. Is it, is it, are WAPs a problem? I'm sure they are. It's, I'm sure it's going to make it harder for a, uh, uh, a clipper, I guess they're called, to you know go and grab the HTML page and then convert it to something that's tolerable on a WAP phone. And there's no reason to ever use them. If you, if you have... If what you want is a consistent user experience and consistent navigation and consistent site info, 
but you don't know how to program and all you know how to do is write static HTML, then uh, frames could potentially be helpful because you can stick something at the top of every page. But in Photo.net, every page is, is generated by a script. So that script might as well just call the um, you know, Photo.net header function, which generates the top of the page in a consistent fashion anyway. So the kind of sites that you guys are going to be building where you have a programmer on staff, i.e. you, um, you might as well uh, just uh, write your code to serve the page that you think you ought to serve. And if you want to put something at the top of every page, then put something at the top of every page. Or just that you scroll down a long page, you still have the navigation there. Right? Yeah, people, people did do that, actually. I mean, the guys who developed Netscape originally, at, the guys who developed frames originally at Netscape, I think they finally retracted all of their ideas and they said that they were sorry. Um, <laughs> and they took it off their home page. I, I think Net, Netscape.com was one of the last sites to have frames and they finally got tired of everybody using Yahoo instead. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so it, it's, not that, it's, not that it, it's not that it was a terrible idea. It's not that it was an obviously terrible idea because I guess they had some some smart people at Netscape at the time they did it, but it, tur it turned out to be a terrible idea. I think you guys would all agree. Supposing you're using technology that might be borderline, like frames or JavaScript or something else, um, and you want to test against everything, is there some free <coughs> single source site that will go on and spider it with every conceivable browser? Well, I think, to in, in, in actually, in, in your problem set one, I encourage you to go over to the Yahoo page of HTML validators. Um, I don't know. People gotten that far? Anybody? Yeah, they, they, they check compliance with uh, with HTML standards, but that's not. <laughs> I mean, browsers themselves don't, don't comply with HTML standards entirely. So there's some. Yeah, that's true. You have a better chance, though, and I think some of them do sort of flag things like JavaScript, and they give you uh, some of the better ones of those will give you warnings, like you know this flavor of JavaScript is unlikely to work in Netscape <laughs> 3.0, or this. Um, you know, this tag isn't supported by MSIE 4.0, uh, stuff like that. There are so there are services. I'm not really an expert on them. I generally try to code to, uh, if I don't have any reason otherwise, I try to make something that would work in Netscape 1.1. I'm not sure what Netscape 1.1 would make of all that, that JavaScript hairball. I have a feeling that it would uh, just ignore it, that, you know, it would be wasted bandwidth, but it wouldn't result in anything being rendered on the page. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure that even at that time, the, I mean, the, the basic HTML standard says if you see a tag that you don't understand, don't display it. And don't display anything in between. More questions? Um, yeah, the, uh, I forget which part exactly it was that you were talking about, but the usability uh, part, I think, where you were saying that you should have basically a link to everything from the front, front page or the home page of the mm -hmm. site. Um, I didn't say that. Nielsen said it. Okay, okay. Nielsen said that. And let me show you the uh, article that you can... You, you really should read this. I, I should have linked to it from there. It's in Ars Digital Systems Journal. And it is um, called What Can We Learn from Jacob Nielsen. So check that out. Okay, my question... And there's a lot of good user comments at the bottom also. Wow. <coughs> People have... Everybody has an opinion on usability. My question regarding that is that when you, when people get to a, a, a like home page or something, I, I think the pay, the part that's above the fold is what they're going to first look at, and if it's below mm -hmm. the fold, that information gets looked at significantly less. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like there's a trade-off between putting all of the information in and getting it in a page that fits above the fold and cutting it out. And do you have any suggestions on how to balance that trade-off? Well. MSNBC is always a good example. So these guys have desperately tried to cram everything in above the fold. And uh, so they've got navigation here, quick links here. I personally, uh, I personally don't like this. I would rather have, they've got a pop up. I would rather have a page like the Photo.net Learn page and scroll, um, but you know Microsoft has probably done some testing and found that this works better for them. Um, I was just going to say I have to define the reference for it, but there are um, having sites on that accept weight from the users 
<laughs> yeah, but there's just no way that that's true on a site like photo.net where they come there to read the articles and. No, that, well, yeah, that's because right. I, actually, that's another thing that I I don't like about um, yeah. So here, it's hard for me to believe that 40% of MS NBC readers actually don't realize that you know MSNBC did not cut off their article after. <laughs> Although the scroll bar does seem to have disappeared from this screen. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's just the projectors too. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's a good answer for that. I personally think it's better to have... I mean, I, I think if you have something... I don't think that MSNBC page was confusing because um, it was pretty obvious. Almost no matter where you were, I think the only problem with this... If you kind of cut off here, I think a lot of people might not ever see that complete story and they might consider that this was complete. I think that's danger. Actually, the New York Times has that bug as well for longer stories. I think I may have to register, unfortunately. Uh, we have to look at actually one of their real. Let's look at one of their real stories. P games fun. Hmm. G G. All right, um, so I've actually emailed New York Times stories to people, and they've said, I didn't see what you're talking about. Ugh, rats. Um, they have this multiple page thing. Uh, let's see if we can find one that does that. Yeah, so... You, if you don't notice that word continued, you're screwed. And this link like one, two, next. So I think this is a terrible, terrible um, design. And I think they would be much better off if they had always, if they just always served a single page view and let people kept, keep scrolling. Maybe they do that because they can sell more banner ads or something if there's more impressions. But I think that they're losing an awful, I think there's a lot more people that know how to scroll but never notice that little continued thing, then there are um, people who, I mean, once you have to scroll anyway, even to get the first page, so. Philip, have you seen the Fidelity.com site? No. Um, Is it good? I, I want to know your opinion. I, All right, we'll say it because I don't want to keep people, yeah. especially since I have to go to the airport. So tomorrow you should have Tracy talking about metadata and how you don't have to do any programming at all which should cheer you up because you're about to spend the next three weeks programming. Um, and um, maybe Monday, I'm also, I'm still going to be in San Francisco on Monday. Uh, you'll have a talk by uh, the uh, ACS team, I hope, on how our digital community system is architected, and you can use some of those ideas maybe in the stuff that you're building. Um, I don't particularly recommend downloading, you know, megabytes and megabytes of code, uh, but on the other hand, there are some interesting high-level ideas. And then uh, Tuesday, I may be tied up in the morning, so I may have to sw switch lectures so that we do lecture like at 4 or 5 or something. But otherwise, I'll be back Tuesday.